Hello, and welcome to the first full video lecture for Introduction to Games for Learning, in which we will be covering the question of what exactly we are even going to be talking about in this course. Games and learning are both pretty broad topics, obviously, and if I was feeling self-indulgent, this one question could pretty much be the course. But we have other things to do this semester, so I'm going to try to rein myself in, and instead of assigning you two dozen articles on the definition of games, I will just include this one disclaimer right here that there are dozens of papers and blog posts and video essays and whole books on the question of defining games, and there are a lot of different opinions and perspectives that don't always agree with each other, and pretty much the only thing everyone does agree on is that games are a really tricky thing to define, and for most purposes, the best thing that game designers and researchers can do is make a working definition that fits the needs of their current situation or project and go with that. So that is what we are going to be doing this first week, is just establishing a working definition of games to start us off with, just to get everybody on roughly the same page. We will come back to this question down the road and update our working definitions along the way too, so nothing in this lecture is set in stone either. This is just to get the discussion started. The big reason that it's so hard to come up with a non-fuzzy definition of games as a category is that games are extremely diverse. All of these things are games, but I think it's fair to say that in a lot of ways they are all more different than similar. Games can be played by one person or by hundreds of people at once. They can be physical or virtual. They can take place in real time or on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. They can be about overcoming challenges and winning, or they can be just about enjoying an experience. We are going to look at all these games and many more like them in this course. So the challenge now is to look past the incredible range of diversity and differences between them and work out what they all have in common, in particular as learning systems. One thing that all games do have in common is that they involve learning, but that's kind of just swapping one really broad idea out for another really broad idea. So we will come back to that, but right now, let's try to get a little more narrow and specific. So this is not actually any more specific yet, but we're working up to it, I promise. Games are a subset of play. There are forms of play that are not games, like building a snowman, or playing pretend, or playing in a jam band, or going dancing. These are all playful activities, but they're not really games. So not all play involves games, but all games do involve play, or at least they do for the purposes of our working definition. There are other opinions and models around the relationship between games and play, and debate over whether all games involve play, which is another reason why we could spend the whole semester just noodling around this one question. But for our purposes, our working definition is that all games do involve some sort of play. There will be opportunities to clarify and debate that point coming up, but that's the working proposition for at least the next... 20 minutes or so. Following from that, I'd like to propose this additional working definition based on an explanation of play from John Dewey, one of the founders of modern education and educational research. Dewey recognized that good learning involved both play and work, and he defined those two things this way, that play is doing anything where you were really just immersed in the flow of the activity in the moment, and work is taking a longer view towards where you're going with the activity and the ultimate outcome that you want to achieve. Any skill that can be learned requires being able to adopt both of these mindsets at different points in the learning process, including getting good at a game. So to update our working definition, games are play activities that are designed to reward both of these two levels of engagement, 
and support moving back and forth between them smoothly. And this is something that good games and good learning have in common. If I had to sum up how I see the relationship between games and learning in one sentence, that's it right here. So games are play that somehow brushes up against work, according to our working definition, which just leaves the question of how exactly games do that. To answer that question, I want to talk about three features of games that we are going to be looking at throughout this course. These three features are rules, goals, and mechanics. And I realize anyone who's already taken a class with me before is probably thinking, oh geez, here goes Sturdy with the three-part Venn diagrams again. And listen, some people have three-part Venn diagrams thrust upon them, some achieve three-part Venn diagrams, and others are just born to it. Let me live my truth. Now, once again, this is just one of many models of the components that make up a game, and there will be other competing definitions of all three of these things that you'll encounter in the course reading. But since our common interest is in understanding games in relation to learning, I'm going to take a stab at explaining rules, goals, and mechanics in those terms as they relate most directly to learning. I'll start off with the easy one, at least I think it's the easiest one, which is goals. Teachers and educators already have plenty of experience with goals, since that's, in one sense, what education is all about. We get students who need knowledge or skills that they don't have yet, and we set goals for helping them to acquire that knowledge and those skills. Dewey's definition of work from a couple slides ago and learning obviously hinges on goals as well. I don't want to go too far and suggest that all learning is inherently goal-driven because I don't think that's necessarily true, and Dewey doesn't either, but goals do play a critical role in learning. Games have goals too, and similar to learning, they're generally defined in terms of where the player is at the start of the game and where they want to be by the end of the game. In sports, you often start off with zero points, and your goal is to get more points. In chess or Monopoly or lots of online shooter games, you start off as one of two or more players, and your goal is to capture or eliminate your opponent's game pieces or avatars to knock them out of the game and be the last player left. Some games can have multiple goals, like in the Pokemon games, you generally have a trainer goal to become the world champion, a story goal to defeat the bad guys and save the world, and a collecting goal where you want to just catch all the different types of Pokemon available in the game. So games can establish and use goals in a lot of different ways depending on the experience the designer wants to create. And educators can learn from these different designs to work out more effective ways to set and achieve goals in learning as well. But what happens if we take the goals out? In that case, what you're left with is a toy. Think about a basketball or a soccer ball. There's nothing inherent in the ball itself that says you have to put it in a net to score points. And so if you don't do that, if you don't pursue that scoring goal, then you're just using the ball as a toy rather than as part of a fully developed game. Will Wright, the main designer behind the Sims series, has actually said several times that he doesn't consider the Sims to be a game. Uh, he considers it to be a digital toy because it doesn't have any inherent goals. Now, you can play it as a game by setting your own goals to make your sim family super wealthy, or in Minecraft to build a fully working pirate ship, but that's up to the individual player to create that layer of gameplay for themselves. If any of you are interested in self-directed learning as a topic to pursue, there's a lot of opportunity in games like this to look at how learners define and then pursue their own learning goals. Item number two is mechanics. 
for our working definition, a game's mechanics are any system that takes player inputs and turns them into changes in the game and feedback that the player can use to see the results of their actions. This is a very inclusive definition because feedback can be anything from scoring points to losing or gaining game pieces or field position to just seeing how your avatar in a video game moves around the world in response to pressing buttons on the controller. Once again, teachers are already pretty familiar with feedback as a part of the learning process, but, and I say this with love, we are all absolutely terrible at feedback compared to even the most generic, middle-tier, forgettable video game. I think that feedback is the number one thing that games can offer to educators to improve teaching and learning, but at the same time, I think the way games handle feedback through mechanics is the biggest jump conceptually from a traditional educational understanding of feedback. So we are going to spend a lot of time on this throughout the course, and the crafting class in particular is all about studying mechanics in detail, but we will pick that back up in the next lecture. Now, if we remove mechanics, which is to say if we remove the game-like feedback, what are we left with? I struggled to come up with the right word for this, and the closest I got was a skill, but I'm open to hearing from anybody who has a better idea for how to name this mechanics-free play. When you take away mechanical feedback, you're left with just the concrete elements of the activity exactly as they really are. Individual sports like running or weightlifting work like this. They still have rules like staying in your lane or waiting your turn, and of course they have goals like beating your opponents or improving on your own performance. But the only feedback they have is that if you finish the race in a certain time, then you have finished the race in that time. What you put into it is exactly the same as what you get out of it. There are no mechanics that transform it into new feedback. Similarly, puzzles have rules and goals, and they can certainly be playful, but as far as feedback, they really only deliver a simple right or wrong result. There is an element of decision making, but it's all about matching a pattern that already exists, not about developing a new pattern through interactions with the mechanics. And for this reason, I would say that quiz-style games like Kahoot or Jeopardy are not really games in the sense that we're using in this course. They don't deliver feedback in a game-like way. And that's not to say that quizzes and puzzles don't have a role in learning. They do. Just that as far as the perspective on feedback specifically, we are going to be looking in a different direction for the most part when we consider games and learning in this course. Okay, item three, rules. On one level, rules seem really simple, but I've put them off until last because that simplicity actually makes rules deceptively hard to get a handle on. So, in simple terms, rules define what is and is not part of a game. The rules of a game are essentially a complete list of all the objects, actions, and relationships that can have meaning within the game. Anything not in the rules has no in-game meaning and is not a part of that game. For example, the player's hands and arms are not a part of the game of soccer. And if they become involved at any point, then the game literally stops and then resets with the no-hands rule back in place. In a game like chess, the rules determine what the pieces are and how they move on the board. There's nothing about the pawns or the knights that inherently makes them move a certain way. But if you start moving pawns around wherever you want, then you're no longer playing the game of chess. You're doing something else. Video games have rules that are more inherent in the game objects themselves. Like if you try to move a piece in a weird way in computer chess, or attack when it's not your turn in a Final Fantasy game, the game won't let you because that's just not a part of the rules of the computer program. It's literally not possible to do that in that virtual game world. 
Now all this starts getting tricky when we take this definition of rules and circle back around to a learning perspective. Once again, rules are not exactly a new concept in teaching, but while the idea of goals and of feedback are, I would say, broadly compatible across pretty much all areas in education, there is no such general agreement on the nature and the best use of rules to support learning, especially when we define them this way in terms of meaning and what has it and what doesn't have it in a given context. On the one hand, rules like this are what separate the different subjects and disciplines, defining one set of meaningful patterns for math and another set for English and so on. But on the other hand, putting rigid boundaries around a subject or a classroom and saying these are the only things that have meaning in here is kind of antithetical to good learning. One of the worst case scenarios for a learning game is that you can present the rules of the game to students and say, here is what matters in this game, and the students say, okay, and then they just completely ignore anything that doesn't directly relate to those rules and to winning the game as efficiently as possible. So they actually miss out on making the meaningful connections you were trying to support because the rules of the game are telling them that those connections have no meaning and don't matter. Just to complicate things further, let's take a look at what happens when you pull rules out of the equation. Now, there are no limits on what is or isn't meaningful beyond the interest and the attention of the individual player. And when that happens, you have a hobby. Now, obviously, all of the example activities I have listed here, like cooking and gardening, can be approached in a rules-driven way, and professionals or trainers would certainly say that there are rules you have to know in order to succeed at these things. But when you approach activities like this as hobbies, it's really up to the individual person to define what is a meaningful part of their experience. And any two hobbyists might have very different ideas and approaches on what they include in their hobby. But at the same time, we all recognize that longtime hobbyists tend to have a very deep level of knowledge and skill about the things they are passionate about. In video games, there are all sorts of communities dedicated to playing games in new and unusual ways, like trying to find glitches or hidden parts of a game, or to finish as quickly as possible. And these players are recognized, generally, as having again, unmatched deep knowledge and understanding of the games they obsess over, but they have that knowledge precisely because they don't follow the rules that the designers originally built into the foundation of the game. I did warn you that rules and learning were tricky. I honestly don't know if we are going to get a handle on this mess by the end of the semester, but we will try and maybe we'll come up with a better working definition between now and then. So, this is our working definition of games from a learning perspective. Games use rules to define meaningful patterns in play, goals to give direction and allow the game to change over time, and mechanics to form feedback loops which guide player decisions as they play. Now, there's just one last question we have to consider here. We are defining games as play that incorporates these three elements, but none of these three elements actually depends on play to function. So what happens if we take the fourth element out of this equation? Well, I think there could be a lot of answers to that question. Rules, goals, and mechanics are everywhere in human societies, and you could describe a lot of different systems and institutions using the three of them together, but one of the things you could pick would definitely be a school. Schools employ rules, goals, and mechanics everywhere at all levels of the teaching and learning experience. Sometimes they are harder to notice, we forget that school is a designed experience, and these things are all conscious decisions that we make and agree to as participants in the school system. 
In games, the rules and goals and mechanics are easy to notice because the whole system of the game is obviously artificial. We understand that this is a designed experience in a way that we don't always manage to bear in mind in places like a school. And I'm not saying that there isn't play in schools, because there obviously is, but it's not always given as much importance as I think it should have. My real point is that once we decide as educators to commit to play, it should actually be really easy to use games to support learning, because games do all of the things that we are already doing in school. They're just doing it in a more playful way. So finally, that brings me to just one last thing I want to talk about before I let you go on the topic of committing to play and what it means to actually get inside a game as a player or as a learner or as a teacher. The concept of the magic circle is one of those things that seems almost too obvious at first, but then you start consciously noticing it, and you start noticing how you never noticed it before, and it actually winds up changing the way you see the whole world a little bit. The term was first popularized by two game designers, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, and we will be hearing from both of them again throughout the course. They described the Magic Circle in their 2004 book, Rules of Play, which, by the way, if I assigned a textbook, this would be the one. And if you want to get deep into game design, you should get a copy. But what Salen and Zimmerman said about the Magic Circle is that it is the place a little bit removed from the regular world, where some of the rules and patterns of meaning change for the purposes of the game and create something new. Players agree to invest in the rules, goals, and mechanics of the game and treat them like real important things. And all the players have to do this so that the game can exist and they can play together. They create this new temporary pattern of meanings that suspends some of the rules of the real world and lets them play in ways that wouldn't be possible outside the magic circle. And there is no way to force anybody to do this, which means playing a game is always voluntary, but to get there you have to step into the magic circle and treat it like it is real while you are continuing to play the game. This concept was introduced to describe games, but it can also describe a space like a classroom, where the concerns of the world outside are put on hold and everybody focuses on creating a shared experience of what Kostakayan calls endogenous meaning. Once again, games and classrooms are really not very different at all, and I'll keep saying that all semester. It's just about finding the game-like features that are already there in the classroom and really committing to them. And with that, we have reached the end of what, believe it or not, was the short version of me trying to address the questions of what games are and how they relate to learning. Thank you for sticking with me all the way through, and I will look forward to seeing your thoughts and responses in the course discussion or in the comments below.